And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. Remember sport, that thing you used to love? It's back. Gamble responsibly. See dunlewy.net. I'm prepared to edit the make well, to play it my country again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Welcome along. Busy football show coming your way. Manchester United lead Southampton by two goals to one at half time at Old Trafford. They went a goal down. Armstrong scored for Southampton. Pogba dispossessed. Southampton pressing high and uh, they duly punished Manchester United, who then responded very well, you would have to say. Just eight minutes later, Marcus Rashford scored his 20th goal of the season. And three minutes after that, Anthony Martial scored his 20th goal of the season at half time. Second half, just about to get underway. Uh, Manchester United lead by two goals to one. Already on the show this evening, we have spoken to President Michael D. Higgins. We've spoken to Packy Bonner. And very happy to welcome to the show as well now uh, the voice of the Charlton era in so many ways, George Hamilton of RTE. George, thanks so much for the time. You're very welcome, Joe. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to have you with us. It's great to have you with us. So um, just give me the background for a second. I know you had done, it was at the 78 World Cup for RTE, but you were over in right. the BBC, and it was about 1984 that uh, you, were, you were poached home. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I spent four years in, in London, and then the great late, great Tim O'Connor had an idea uh, that he wanted to put on first division football on, on RTE on a Saturday afternoon sports stadium. And he wanted an Irish voice that would be associated with first division football. And I'd been doing that uh, in England. So he, he poached me home, so to speak. I was very happy to come home because at that stage I had uh, two young children and it was nice to think that they'd be brought up in Ireland. So uh, yes, I came back then and that kind of coincided uh, with a key moment in Irish football history. Owen Hand, good friend of mine, but it didn't work out for him in qualification for the World Cup in, in Mexico in 86. So he was let go by the FAI at the end of the qualifying campaign in 85. And then early 86, what happens? Jack Charlton gets appointed the manager of the Republic of Ireland football team. And Jack Charlton was a man I, had, I knew kind of because he'd been a co-commentator with me between management jobs when I was with the BBC. I'd done a couple of games with him at Newcastle, his, his basically his home club. So I kind of knew him. Um, I, I, and it was great to think that uh, here, here was a man, a World Cup winner, you know, that was the big thing, was coming in to manage the Republic of Ireland team. I was new in the job as, as the commentator on these matches, uh, I, I, and it just went from there. What was he like as a co-commentator? He was, well, well the thing is, I, I, I'm blessed, I have to say, with a half-decent memory, and I, I do remember when things go wrong. And all I can say is <laughs> that whatever it was about... Jack Charlton as a co-commentator, nothing went wrong. He didn't mess names up or anything like that, because if he had, I'd remember it all these years later. What he was like as a co-commentator, he was straight, he was to the point. Uh, and my recollection of him is thinking uh, at the time, you know, centre half, big centre half, not renowned as a, as a ball playing centre half, though he could when it required, as his last goal for Leeds Adips, which showed. Uh, which has been doing the rounds on the on the internet recently. Um, no, no. What, what what I remember about him was he was blunt and he was straight, but he had he had great insight. And why wouldn't he with all those matches behind him? George, to your eye, what kind of football did Ireland play before Jack's arrival? Say under own hand, for instance. Were we like we, we were never a possession based team? I would have thought. But do we aspire to play a, a certain brand? We aspired to. We aspired to. Look, I'll, I'll tell you another story, Joe. When I was in the BBC in Belfast, I'm only new at the game now, and we're back in the 70s. And the way the pictures got to RTE in those days, they came from uh, England to Scotland to Belfast to Dublin. Uh, and it, it, they went through the control room and broadcasting house in Belfast where I was working. Republic of Ireland were playing in France one night in the mid-70s, and uh, I wanted to see the match live. And, and I did a little deal with the guys in the control room, and they let me come in and sit in the control room the master control, and they wouldn't happen nowadays, you'd be under lock and key, but back then it was okay. And I, I, I was allowed to come in and watch the uh, the Republic of Ireland playing in Paris that night, because I, I was always interested in, in any Irish team playing anywhere. And what happened that night was that, that, that they tried to play possession football, and I, I think it was John Giles, of all people, was dispossessed, which led to the first French goal. Just something that stuck in my mind about that. So, yeah, Ireland seemed to want to play possession football when maybe they had a John Giles or a Liam Brady or somebody who could potentially uh, play the possession game, but but they didn't have enough around him, it seemed, at, uh, over the years to enable them to do just that. And so 
when they tried to play football, it never quite worked out against the stronger teams and they never quite made it. I mean, there were the famous near misses and all that, but but it just seemed that they just that they had never quite hit on a style that would actually work uh, for the, uh, the some of the parts. So Jack gets the job. It seems like it was a more open time with the media, uh, certainly, and yet he could be gruff as well. Were you in those, like, certainly in some of those days, you're doing some of the post match interviews as well as doing the commentary? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, the thing is, and, and it's funny, we, we, Eugene O'Neill, our, 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 uh, our editor, our, our soccer editor in RT, he was digging out a lot of old tapes from uh, the past uh, for the 30th anniversary of the, of the Italy game. Uh, and he said, I came across this interview you did with Jack in Sports Stadium. And I was intrigued by it because it went on for quite a long time and Jack was clearly uncomfortable with the line of questioning that you were putting. But he was sitting there taking it, taking it, taking it. And he said it, it was obvious that he had a, a respect for you uh, having to ask the questions that you did, even if he didn't want to actually have to answer them. And mm. I, 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 that, that kind of brought, it, brought back into my head the fact that that's how Jack was. You know, he respected what you had to do and the job that you did. If you overstepped the mark, famous famous examples, of course. But if you if you overstep the mark, then it became difficult. But if you were down the middle and playing it straight, Jack would take it on the chin and try to deal with it. And there was always the respect from Jack that, you know, we'll, we'll forget about this. If, if it went badly last night, tomorrow we'll be fine. Uh, so, you know, he, he took it. And this is what Eugene, my colleague, was seeing. Jack feeling uncomfortable, not wanting to be there, but yet seeing it through. Sometimes you, you get an insight into a person uh, limited as our, our, our access is in media through a, a small gesture or a bit of body language or just someone's general way with you over the years. Mm. How was Jack with you? What struck uh, you about Jack in those uh, moments around interviews or, or the little bits you saw of him? I, I have to be honest and say I never had any difficulty with Jack because I think it helped that I, I had that relationship, albeit brief mm. and uh, cursory, before he ever became the Ireland manager, like he knew who I was when he sat, when I sat down to interview him the first time, the first day in the job, so to speak, when he was on the line from Newcastle, from the BBC in Newcastle, and I was sitting in Donnybrook in Dublin mm. doing the interview down the line for Sports Stadium. He, I wasn't a stranger to him. It wasn't as if he'd landed by parachute in, among this press corps of, of Irish journalists whom he had yet to get to know. He actually knew this guy because he dealt with me. He, he'd sat alongside me and in, in commentary boxes. So from the start, I was, I suppose, at a little bit of an advantage. Though not that that counted for anything when the thing developed and, and the press corps then had made their relationship with Jack and it became it became the relationship that they had over all the years and it was a very solid and sound relationship that they had. But I was lucky because I was kind of uh, ahead of the game, got off the grid faster, but then everybody caught up, of course, and why wouldn't they? Mm. But I'll, t I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a lovely story about Jack and the, and the kind of man he was. And I think... This sums him up completely. We had a famous floor manager in RT who's sadly no longer with us, and his name was Ty De Bruyne, and he and he was my wingman uh, at USA '94. So he was in the commentary box with me at all times, and he was with me on the road at all times. So we did the opening game for Ireland, uh, which was the game against Italy when Ray Houghton scored the goal at Giant Stadium, and then uh, the next day we were to go to see Norway play Mexico in Washington because they were the other two teams in our group. So we were flying down to Washington from uh, New York airport in New York and on the same plane was Jack. And when we arrived in uh, New York, in uh, Washington, uh, there was a guy with a board up with Jack Charlton's name on it. And Jack said, hey guys, uh, there's a lift for me. I'm not going to let you go in a taxi, come with me. So he gave us a lift to the stadium and that was all great. And then uh, Tig sought Jack as a potential halftime interviewee uh, because obviously that would beef up our coverage if at halftime we could speak to the Ireland manager and say, what about these two teams that we're watching on the pitch here because uh, uh, we're going to be playing Norway and Mexico. Mm -hmm. And Jack was very, very reluctant to, 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 to take this on because he was there to, to concentrate and, and, to, and to sit in the VIP box and to just watch the game. Mm -hmm. And Tig reminded him gently, Tig was a wonderful, wonderful man. And he got he got the best out of everybody and he got interviews where nobody was entitled to interview. Tig said to Jack, Jack, you know, you have an agreement with RTE that you'll make yourself available when we want to interview you. And Jack's reaction was was not great, but he, he remembered he had made this promise. So he said, OK, you come and get me and I'll come to you at halftime. Mm. So in the way of American Stadia, the, the RFK in, uh, in uh, 
Washington. And we were all in little booths, and Jack's VIP booth was just along the way from ours. So at halftime, Tig went out to get him, and he brought him in. And he sat, he sat Jack down in, Tig, in his own chair, in Tig's chair, and I'm beside him. So I'm about to interview Jack after the commercial break, and Jack's sitting there, and he turns his back on me. And I think, how do I interview this guy? So I, I put the question, and Jack answers it, but he's, he's looking away over there. And, and I'm thinking, well, at least he's answering me. Mm. And it was only afterwards we realized what was going on. Jack didn't want to do the interview, and this was his way of <laughs> showing that he didn't want to do it, but he did it nonetheless. And then what happened? That's not the end of the story, because at the end of the game, we're all coming out, and because we're close at hand, like he's only two doors along this corridor of VIP boxes, one of which is our commentary box, he sees us and he says, lads, lads, uh, I, I'm meeting a guy, a friend of mine, uh, we're going out to dinner, will you come and join us? Wow. And we went, we went. And, the, and we were their guests. And that was Jack. That was the day. On the plane, gave us the lift, didn't want to do the interview, but did it, and then took us out to dinner. That is a different era. Oh, my God. In the midst of a World Cup. Yeah, and that's all in Tide's book, by the way. Poor, poor Tide's no longer with us, I say. But if you ever get a chance to read it, Tunnel Vision, it's called. Yeah. Tunnel Vision, um, amazing uh, memoir of a guy who was at the heart of so much. You know, all Ireland's everything. That's why mm. he called it Tunnel Vision, because he was the man in the tunnel, Grammy Lee. <laughs> Even by the standards of the day, to have the Irish manager in the midst of a tournament say, here, I'll give you a lift, and then, you know, do whatever, do the interview or not, and then to say, come out for dinner with me. Even you must have been thinking, this is pretty special. I mean, I, w I wouldn't think this is happening down the road with other teams and managers. Oh, no, 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 absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, my first World Cup, to, to which you mentioned, Argentina, I was uh, dispatched to Mendoza and had six matches there over four weeks. And the team that was based there was Holland. So I fell in with some Dutch journalists. And I. Uh, this is my first World Cup now. I'm, I'm a real greenhorn. Mm. Uh, but I tagged along with these three guys who became lifelong friends of mine, uh, Theo and Case and Eddie. Uh, and I'm still in touch with them. But anyway, back to 1978, I'm tagging along as like an honorary Dutchman. Mm. But they're getting nothing like the access to their manager then that I'm getting now. And this is the Dutch World Cup team. Uh, I'm with the Republic of Ireland World Cup team. And the manager is taking myself and my, my wingman out to dinner. No, I, you're absolutely right, Jim. What, what's Jack Charlton like over dinner? Oh, he's great. He's absolutely great. He, he is the life and soul of the party. And th this is the thing I would say about him, you know, the guard down, relaxed. Jack is just one of the guys. Uh, no airs, no graces, no nothing. No, I'm a World Cup winner. No, I'm Jack Charlton. No, I did this or I played, all, played that, won the league, won the cup. No, he's just full of stories. Uh, and, and the more the more comic the stories the better and he just he was just great company he was always great company always great company yeah i can imagine so i presume I, I presume george hamilton you weren't having regular dinners with jack charlton the, the, no, even no. this was an exception i hope it, it was absolutely <laughs> out of the blue right completely out of the blue and he was there uh, managing at the world cup and bear in mind this is like well it wasn't day two because obviously there'd been a build-up and all that and they'd had their first match but it was match day plus one you know, yeah. he was kind of relaxed as well because they'd beaten Italy. Uh, he was in a good place, clearly, uh, building up to the to the next match. So he was relaxed, and the next match was a couple of days away, and he'd seen the opposition, and he, and he figured it out what he wanted to figure out. And, and he had this mate that he was going to see. So he, in his headspace, he was in a really good place. Um, and so we happened to be there, and we got lucky. Mm -hmm. But no, 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 we, it wasn't the case that, Jack Charlton was taking RTE out to dinner. No, no, no. This was just a one-off. This was okay. just a one-off. One-off, one-off, one-off. Uh, you, look, you, you've had to, I mean, you've been doing this job and, and brilliantly as well, clearly, for a long time. So there have been some, some barren summers in there as well. I, it, won't have, it won't have escaped your attention more than most, the effect, uh, not that it's the, the primary one, but the effect that the Charlton era had on your career, on your life, on your legacy, on, you know, geez, I mean... My, my legacy... <laughs> well, I, like, they, they, if if I if I say to if I was to say to anyone if I was to say to anyone, the nation holds its breath, you know, there's not many people who wouldn't know exactly what I'm talking about. That is a legacy. That's a best. Thank you. You know, Thank that, you. and and geez, what a line to come out with at the right time, right place. There were only a couple of million people watching George. No pressure. <laughs> that was the day, wasn't it? That really was the day. I know, but you're you're, you're right. I, I I got lucky. I mean, there's no question mm. about that. Uh, we talked about how I ended up uh, back in uh, back in Dublin, uh, thanks to the late Tim O'Connor. Um, but you know, the the FAI could have appointed 
Joe Bloggs, with no disrespect to Joe, you know what I mean? Mm. They could have appointed another manager who might have lasted two and a half years or three years and then gone. Mm. And so the cycle would have continued and nothing would have become of the Republic of Ireland football team. But Jack Charlton, uh, his charisma, his the, the Pied Piper in him, uh, the belief, you know, it, it strikes me, and, and I'm not the first to say this, I've noted other people have said it too, but what Jack was doing with the style of play that he had, they have, they have a they have a trendy German word for it now called Gegenpressing. pressing. But mm. Jack was doing this thirty years ago, mm. and and that that was the basis of his of his success was the kind of thing that Jurgen Klopp is doing uh, with multi million pound squad uh, at Liverpool now. Jack Jack had worked out as a centre half that um, you know I I never liked it. Some people don't like it up them. He didn't like it over him and making him turn. Mm. So so he didn't. He knew how to make top players uncomfortable. He'd gone to that Mexico World Cup uh, to observe it uh, with his wife Pat, and had come away saying, "I've nothing to learn because I can see what 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 will work, because everybody's knocking it about nice and tidy, and only that waiting for the opening and then going for it. If I, if I make the opening by putting the ball over the top yeah. and making them chase, and John Aldridge, who's a guy of immense time for, and I've spent a lot of time with over the years, even even since he stopped playing, you know, at various." Liverpool ex players functions and John would always say, you know, it, it, it was maybe not what we wanted to do, but when he told us that if we did this, this would happen, we did it because we could see it would work. So instead of poaching goals, I mean, how long did it take John Orders to score a goal for Ireland? You know, yeah. that was because he was running into corners to to create the opportunities for the flood to come through and get the one the one goal that would actually matter that would win the match. And it, it was just wonderful. Um, uh, and, and 10, 10 glorious years, but I know I, I'm, I'm rabbiting on a bit no, away off the point. No, sorry, it's, 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 a great, it's a great point, actually. And <laughs> do you know what? It's, it reminds me of something, and the listeners will forgive me. We, we played a little bit of this earlier on, seeing as you brought this up, because it's, it's such a pertinent point, and we can dismiss the tactics a little bit without appreciating uh, the method. So here is, I don't know if you've heard this, but here is uh, Jack. This is about 1996, certainly after the tenure has just ended, and he's on Desert Island Discs with Sue Lawley and just it's amazing what you've just said is going to be borne out by the man himself but it's really interesting so here's Jack in 96 have a listen on Desert Island Discs so Jack you were appointed manager of the Republic of Ireland in 1986 and immediately and and stubbornly they say you imposed your style of what they call kick and rush football on them no people that have said that of us are totally wrong we had to design a game that would frustrate international teams at a level we wanted to compete at. And I had to come up with an, a way of playing that would cause them problems. Nobody had ever put the defenders in, in, into a position to see if they could play. You know, we always assumed they could play because you get so many numbers back and they can head the ball out, they kick the ball away and they, they play. But nobody ever really applied what you call pressure. Now, I wanted to apply pressure. I'd seen the World Cup in uh, Mexico. In, it was at 86. And... Uh, it was like peas in a pod. Everybody played the same way through a playmaker in midfield, and unless the playmaker was in a good position to go with the back four, nobody would commit themselves forward. The, the, the team with the best centre midfield player won the World Cup, which was Maradona playing for Argentina. And I thought, we can't enter this fray the way they play. Because you hadn't got enough good players. We, well, we got, we got, we got, we could get the players to play in a similar type of game, but we've had 15, 10 to 15, 20 years start on playing that game. Now, for us to went on that fray and play that type of game would have been nonsense. Well, why? Just let, let's just have it straight. It, this is because they would be playing with the ball, passing the ball in their own half, which is very dangerous because somebody dangerous. could come along and shove yes. it in the goal. Right. Uh, so yes. you want to kick and kick and rush means no. get it up the field no, as fast no, as you can no, out no, of danger. No, definitely not, Sue. Definitely not. That was never the way everything was designed each player had what they were and what were they supposed to do if we got to the foot the, the ball to a fullback what you need to do is you need to, to hit to, to pass the long ball to an area where your player knows the ball is going to be delivered hmm. so he is already on his way there before the defender knows where the ball is going and it began to work and it worked like a charm we we beat brazil but it depended on people playing exactly as you said you almost as a manager want to program players don't you to have an instinctive reaction no, to do no, what you believe they should players. do in, in a way, it's unprogrammed players. See, I give each player one individual thing to do. John Aldridge knew that when Dennis Irwin got the ball at right back, that the ball would be knocked in behind the fullback. 
So John was programmed into going for that. Mm. Ray Houghton knew that the moment John got to the ball first, he had to be somebody in front of him. So, so there was a knew... set thing for them to do. It does make them into automatons to an well, extent, it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, but you see, only to a degree into the last third of the play of, of the park. Some of your critics in Ireland oh. said that this was a crude way of no, playing, no, that no, you no. were taking all that wonderful what artistic is, stuff out of the game where is, people move for the ball. What is football about? It's about winning, isn't it? It's about winning. It's about scoring goals. How you score them and how you go about it is a matter of opinion. Now, they might have had a different opinion than me, but I saw what was necessary for us to get results and to move the team. It amazes me that teams like Milan and many of the European teams, now there's a terminology in European football called um, pressing. We were doing that in 1986. Mm. What a piece of radio that is, by the way. Take a bow, Sue Lolly. It's it's magic, isn't it? It is. It is absolutely. Yeah. And then, but the, but that was Jack. That you heard him explain it, um, and he did it without any kind of aggression or condescension. He did, he was simply explaining the logic of it mm. in in his own gentle but forthright way. That it made absolute sense to him, and he was uh, putting the point across. Because a more, a more conventional thinker might have gone to the 86 World Cup and said, well, oh, everyone's playing this way. I've got Liam Brady. This is obviously how I should play. But he was, I mean, there's a stubbornness to him as well. Uh, of to, course. To, to, well, we can't take away this. Yeah, to say, well, every, they've 15 year, 20 year head start in us. I'm going to go a completely different way. Yeah. Well, I think, though, it, it, what was evident in, in that clip that you played uh, from Desert Island, this was, he, he was he was pragmatic. That was the other thing about him. He was an absolute pragmatist. Mm. He knew, and I, I often have thought over the weekend about, you know, after his passing, about, about his background. His whole background brought him to this point. You know, the kid who was steeped in football, his uncle was Jackie Milburn uh, on his mother's side of the family, that great uh, Newcastle number nine. Uh, he actually began his working life down the pit because that's what you did, because mm. he wasn't the sleek, sleek footballer that maybe his younger brother, brother Bobby was. But after a while down the pit, he came up and said, I, I need to play football because it was either football or down the pit and he couldn't stick it down there. And so he stuck at being a footballer uh, and, and this informed his every thought from there on, you know, make the best of what you've got. Uh, and I think he saw that in, if he tried to do what everybody else did, it was going to go nowhere. He had to be different. He had to get out of the pit, so to speak, and try to play football. And the football that he tried to play was this football. Uh, and I do think it's, it's so ironic. Uh, you know, the, the, it is now flavour of the month. Uh, and yet, as he said himself, he was doing that back in 1986. What was what were the tournaments like for you? You know, Italia 90, Euro 88, trekking around. Were they were fun and adventure filled or maybe less glamorous than I'm presuming? Oh, no, 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 Joe. They were, they were the most wonderful life experiences you could possibly imagine. Uh, the first one, um, because I spent time in what was then West Germany, uh, as a as a student and a, as a younger man, uh, I had a, an affinity with the place, and Stuttgart was where I had friends. The whole thing came together in Stuttgart for me that day. That that was like my my day of days right. uh, when Ireland beat England in Stuttgart, and then to go on to Hanover uh, and, and just enjoy the whole German experience. Um, and I, I was in the stadium on my way to the comedy box the, the day they played the Soviet Union, and I saw these guys. Uh, coming towards me in, in Ireland shirts. And this was the, uh, you know, the summer after Know Your Sport had started. And I, I was convinced these guys were going to say hello to me as the presenter of Know Your Sport. <laughs> and they blanked me and they walked straight past. And it was only then that I realized they were Germans. Uh, the West German team was nowhere near Hanover, so they picked the team to follow. And it was Ireland. Mm. Um, I mean, and, and then, you, then when that happened, you think to yourself, my goodness, uh, there's a popularity factor here about this Irish team. Uh, the unusualness of it, even the unusualness of a team playing in green, if you think about it, because there aren't that many international teams playing in green, Mexico do, but, but not, not too many do. So you, you had this going on, uh, you had the Germans buying into it, uh, you had the unluck, uh, unlucky elimination with the, with the, the Vim Keefe goal, uh, and, and, and that just left everybody wanting more. Mm. But the thing was, because it was such a, a short tournament, uh, and we must never forget that the two other teams in Ireland's group actually contested the final. So that told you something about how good Ireland were or how well they had played. Uh, that left what everybody wanting for more. And of course, there were those who had missed it because uh, it, it was something new. And uh, 
the idea of buying into it maybe wasn't as big as it, it might become. But when it became the World Cup, in Italy two years later, then everybody wanted to be a part of it. And so if Germany, for me, at the personal level, had been a wonderful adventure, Italy was just that expanded by a hundredfold. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned the Lake Tide, the Brune. My, my uh, uh, fellow traveler, for want of a better expression, was another RTE floor manager at the time, Tom Flanagan, in Italy. And he and I uh, traversed the country. I think we did 19 flights up and down Italy. Uh, traveling up and down Italy like a yo-yo, as, as, as somebody told us, mm. um, to, to go to the various venues. And it, it was just, you know, well, if you think back to the, the kid growing up in Belfast and, 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 and watching the World Cup and black, grainy black and white television, to actually be at this World Cup and there's a team there that you're actually following and covering and that they're doing well mm. and they've got out of the group and they're in the last 16. And my goodness, now they're, they're in the quarterfinal. You know, it's just, it, it was absolutely phenomenal. And of course, my view about the tournament that followed, which was 92, was that if Ireland had not had the misfortune to blow a 3-1 lead in Poland and had Gary Lineker not scored that late goal for England to qualify to them and knock Ireland out, uh, Ireland could well have won that Euro 92 because it was an 18 tournament mm. and was won by the team that didn't qualify, Denmark, mm. who were only there because Yugoslavia had been kicked out for political reasons. And then we actually do get to the next World Cup and that is just so such another big deal because it's it's America and America's half Ireland uh, and it's, it's just another great adventure um so no 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 drudgery uh, no negativity mm. they they were wonderful adventures Joe uh, and I feel unbelievably privileged to have the chance uh, to be part of the journey that Jack took us all on yeah no it's, it's amazing to hear I have two last quick questions then uh, on the day of the Romania game uh, the penalty shootout and everything I'm sure you're jubilant and you're celebrating, but does, does part of you realise there's a good chance that's the biggest day of my career? Like, that, that is just surreally big to have been the voice of that. Just on a personal point of view, you know, your own ego for a second. Does part of you realise that will be, um, you know, from a commentator's point of view, that's my tombstone moment? Not, not in the moment, Joe. Maybe over the years. Mm. Maybe, if I'm honest, over the years. But not in the moment, because... Um, uh, you know yourself, uh, on the air, adrenaline, the rest. The game didn't end with a final whistle for me. Uh, the broadcast didn't end. The game ended, uh, and I left the commentary box with Tom Flanagan and the bottle of uh, Asti Spumanti that we smuggled into the ground, uh, bought in Milan uh, that morning. Uh, and we went under the tunnel that was underneath the pitch, to the far side of the pitch, to the interview room, uh, where uh, they'd assembled Packy and David, Oh, I've seen, uh, I've seen key. that. Yeah, they're they're coming yes. in almost, and you're there trying to grab words with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then and then this bottle of Asti Spumanti that has travelled a hundred miles from Milan to Genoa in the searing heat of an Italian autostrada, <laughs> and has sat for three hours in the stadium at my feet in the searing heat of a, an Italian Monday afternoon, <laughs> and has then and has then produced to the two boys who take a sip and realise that it's actually. Uh, quite possibly uh, effervescent vinegar by this stage <laughs> and warm and they pour it over my head uh -huh. live on television yeah no. <laughs> so there wasn't time to think of a tombstone no that's fair that's enough that's fair enough <laughs> Jeez, that's the fun of it though isn't it well that the last point I guess was for you to, to, you said it. That's to the sum fun up of it. Yeah, yeah. The, the legacy as much as anything is people just had so much fun you know yeah they did they did totally totally and they were great days Abs great days absolutely Listen, uh, thanks so much for coming on and, and paying tribute and giving your memories of the whole era. It's just kind of magical. And, and look, he's 85 years of age, or was 85, and he, he lived a, a rich and wonderful life. But there is a sadness about the whole thing, obviously, as well. Passage of time, uh, part of that sadness. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's hard to believe, you know, it, it's, uh, what, 25 years ago since since that night at Anfield uh, when it all ended and he and Morris went out onto the pitch to salute the fans. And, and I, I felt it was almost like saying goodbye. Uh, mm. You know, you've been on a... You've come on a, a, a trip uh, and you've met all the relations and now it's time to go home mm. uh, and, and you're saying goodbye. And, and there was, but, the, but but it was a lovely way to, to end in the sense that, you know, uh, he had done all he could do. Yeah. Um, Did that go out and, live on the air, George, do you, do you know? or is Because I've we've seen the footage and it's, it's, it's stunning, you know, and everybody's singing You'll Never Walk Alone. Did, I, did, did Orty have that live on the night, do you remember, or do you know? I, I don't recall, right. to be quite honest with you. I, I, I don't, I... I I'd be, I'd be telling a lie if I said yes. I, I was certain they did. Mm. Um, I don't recall. I, I, I recall seeing it, but mm. then I was there uh, to see it.
And the but footage, it, the footage you know, still exists, you know, because it's amazing footage, and he's quite emotional. Yes, yeah, and it's you know what led up to that. I think we, we it tends to get a bit maybe forgotten. You know, every, everything had gone well uh, through all the other campaigns, barring the Sweden one. Um, that that it, it all started to unravel on a, a very wet night in Portugal uh, when Portugal won, and and then it started to unwind and. The, there was a nil-nil draw in Liechtenstein, mm. um, only four points from, they beat Latvia, I think, but from the last number of games in qualification, from looking good, they just kind of unraveled. There were injuries, there were suspensions, and he didn't have his full complement. And and maybe maybe his plan, his style had, had, been, had been cracked, mm. you know? So there comes a time, uh, and that old famous phrase, and, the tide and the affairs of men, you know, it, there aren't too many managers make it to 10 years. Um, he didn't either, though. I think that's a shame. They, they could have let him resign on the 10th anniversary in, in February 96. But mm. anyway, that's another day's work. Mm. Um, it was it, it was just uh, it, it, almost inevitable that this was going to be the end of it. There was a feeling of the, the end of an era. They stayed in Chester for that match. Um, and my colleagues all left early to go to Anfield to set up. And I was the only RTU one left, and there was just me, uh, no press around at that stage. I, they'd all gone off. Um, I had a hire car to drive to the ground, and the, the players were still at the hotel, uh, getting up from their siesta to have their pre-match meal. Uh, and there was just, you almost sensed that they knew that this was whatever they were going to do, and they were going to do their utmost to, do, to, to get to Euro 96. Mm. And what a finale that would have been for Jack, the World Cup winner back in England. But it it didn't happen, and um, but there was almost a feeling even before the game that this young Dutch, uh, young young plus experience. Uh, I think young because Cliver scored the crucial goal, but but young plus experience um, was just going to be too a bridge too far, and mm. and so it proved. But it, it was a, a, an immensely emotional night, you know. And it's December too; it's coming up to Christmas, and it was just uh, it, it it was a lovely ending. If if if, if it's there's such sweet sorrow and sadness, you know. Mm. <laughs> just, mm. That's just the way it was. But we couldn't but be be thankful and grateful for what had happened. And in the ten years, what what all else had happened in Ireland, and how it had, you know, we couldn't equate Ireland '95, '96 to Ireland '85, '86. Yeah, it was just a completely different country. George, listen, thanks so much. That was great. Much appreciated. Thank you, Joe. Thank Cheers. you indeed. George Hamilton there. In his 52nd international appearance, David O'Leary is entrusted with the responsibility of taking the penalty that could send Ireland into the quarterfinals of the World Cup. This kick can decide it all. The nation holds its breath. Yes! Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. When you've watched more Belarusia Premier League than is healthy, proper football is back. Gamble responsibly, cwe.net. Now, more than ever, supporting local matters most. And News Talk is coming together with local businesses and communities right across the country to champion green. My name is Aveline. I'm owner of Bloom in a Box. I'm Aaron of Green Saffron Spices. I'm Fiona Heaney, fashion designer and owner of Fiji. This island is full of brave businesses and innovators with amazing produce and services. The last few months of staying apart, I think, has shone a spotlight on the beautiful Irish spirit of resilience. It's so important now more than ever to champion green. Take the pledge to Champion Green now at championgreen.ie And follow the movement on air and on newstalk.com slash champion green. Missing this? This is the dream. Shohi on Vring Lord. Whether you're from Cushendall in Antrim or Mount Sinai in Watford, this is what it's all about. And get this. The all-new OTB Sports app. Off the Ball, Ireland's premier sports channel, now has a new home. Featuring the biggest names in Irish and world sports. Podcasts, interviews, news 
commentary, analysis, plus almost 20 years of sporting archives. All free, and ready when you are, at home or on the go. The new OTB Sports app. Download it now from the App Store and Google Play. In Tuesday's Farming Independent, we take an in-depth look at debt levels on Irish farms. In Pedigree, the farmers leading the fight to save rare native breeds of sheep and cattle. And the young woman cooking up a storm from the family farm in West Cork. The Farming Independent, real stories worth paying for. In print or subscribe at independent.ie. The sky's the limit when you're with three. We've decided to make the rest of the year a little easier by making our bill pay and broadband plans half price until 2021. And with truly all-you-can-eat data, you can FaceTime forever with the ones you love. Plus, get the amazing Samsung S20 for free when you switch or upgrade today. Three, make it count. Selected plans only. Standard monthly charge applies from 2021. Up to 24-month contract applies. All-you-can-eat data. ROI only. See 3.e. Has your car insurance increased this year? Stop. Don't pay it until you call Sheridan Insurances. Our friendly team of experts are here to speak to you and understand your needs. We search over 15 insurers to get you the best insurance policy, leaving you more time and money to enjoy the important things in life. Shop local. Call Sheridan Insurances today. Sheridan Insurances Limited is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Football on Off the Ball with Paddy Power. When you've seen West Ham beat Preston in the 19th 1963 FA Cup final for the sixth time. Live football is back. Gamble responsibly, cwe.net. You're welcome back. Uh, 12 minutes to go in the second half at Old Trafford. It has been uneventful by comparison with the first. It is still 2-1. Martial and Rashford with the goals for Manchester United. 10 minutes to go there. Stays like this. United leapfrog Leicester and Chelsea and go to a third. Now, we've had George Hamilton. Our next guest uh, wears many hats, including his brilliant podcast, which you'll find in all the usual places. Dave McWilliams, good evening. Joe, how are you? Very well. So let's get one thing straight, right? You and all the economists. And you can talk to me about the Berlin Wall or multinationals <laughs> or social partnership or the education system. The Celtic Tiger is down to Jack Charlton and the Irish team. And let's put that one to bed. Without right a the shadow off. of a doubt. Without <laughs> a shadow of a doubt. Leading to a question... Uh, 1999, as we're going into the Celtic Tiger. No, it was, uh, you know, I must admit, I was thinking, I might be one of the few people you will have interviewed who were at his first game and his last game. All right, good man. Wales. That's, a, that's Wales, Wales. Went with my dad, I think Neville Southall, Everton keeper. Mm. I think might have broken his ankle. And you might remember that Lansdowne Road in those days was... I mean, the surplus was appalling mm. because, and it's no doubt that he put, there was probably a rugby match on. It was, I believe, in the middle, the middle Marchish time. Yeah, Six time. Nations, yeah. So I'd say there was some sort of mucky Six Nations game played about a week before, and there'd be ruts all over the place. And uh, yeah, and I remember seeing the unfurling of the Go Home Union Jack banner, mm. which was something because I mean, you might remember, you know. These were these were these were grim times for Ireland's Irish soccer because the actual soccer team was quite good, and had been very good in the early eighties and very unlucky. And uh, there was a sense that you know Jack would play this up and at you football, which he did. And the purest of which there were many. You know, there's a, there's a rule of thumb is that the more appalling the results, the more purest you get in the terrace. Mm. That's a general rule, I think, in every game. Mm. First, and then I went to the. Uh, the Anfield game, the Dutch game. And I remember there being a real sense of, we're just not at the races here. Yeah. And it didn't matter how many times the fields were so, or you'll never beat the Irish, you know. I think it was, it was a Clivert at his best. Mm. And uh, just dancing rings around. But they were great times. And you're absolutely right. Uh, if... Uh, correlation is not causation, as they say in economics. The yeah. correlation between the uh, the glory years and the economy, no doubt, no doubt. But it's actually very, very sad. It's funny. It's uh, very poignant for loads of us who uh, who involved ourselves in the madness. So that's all I can say, in, in, in an active rather than passive way, and followed the team and roared in pubs and hugged fellas and people you'd never seen before and get up on people's shoulders and roar and shout at the television. You know, that's my memory of those mental times. Mm. And, uh, and he was at the epicentre. 
at the epicenter exactly and if you take 86 to 96 i mean you you have such a brilliant way of uh describe you know n noticing and describing the changes in a nation and clearly ireland changed a lot in that 10 years and it, it's intertwined it, yeah intertwined Massively. with that period it's hard to know it's hard to imagine that period of change without the irish team at that time i think you're right actually i think you're right i've always thought uh, and one of the one of the great uh, truths that that off the ball bring to, to, to sports coverage, that sports is culture, deep, deep culture. And actually football, for me, is deep Irish culture. I know that to be uh, very much uh, flagged off by the GAA family. But what I, I mean is that football seems to bring Irish people together uh, in a way that other sports don't. I mean, certainly the recent success of the rugby team, although extraordinary given the size of the, the country in terms of the game, didn't have the same sort of all-encompassing across classes, across culture, mm. unifying. It, there was a certain enormous joy in following that team. Mm. And there was a certain expectation that the results were important and they were going our way, but that the, actually was an understanding. I, I really believe, Joe, that the team was really very good. People forget that, that player for player, this was as good a team as was turning up in any European country during most of that period. And the way in which this team sort of doled out, doled it out to England on many occasions, mm. uh, I always thought was particularly... It was, this was a team that wasn't just lucky and it wasn't just a uh, you know, folly the big lad up front team, as people described it. I, I think they were... Even if you watch now over the weekend... Some of the interchanges of play, uh, particularly revolving around Ray Houghton during pivotal games, uh, there was a sort of a there was a character of this team that was, was extraordinary. So, if you look at the economy, there's a if you look at YouTube coverage of the way we looked in 1988 and the way we looked in 1996 in terms of sociology, it was a totally different culture that was going to watch the football team, you know. And I, I just thought it was it was one of those great times, and I was I was very saddened. My my missus kind of laughed at me, you know, on Saturday. I was mm. yeah, I'm sad about that. No, it's about an era. It's about a passage of time. I, I was saying earlier on. I think a lot of people have probably subtracted thirty from the current age and remembered wistfully, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where they were and could they ever be that young? And my God! And when I say you can't imagine that period of change without the Irish team, I don't mean again causation. I just mean. It was well, so can't. integral to the, the, story. the experience, part of yes. The story. Yeah. Part of the and I mean, you know, the, 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 the idea of just that self-confidence and we can do this and the economy took off. I mean, just before the Euro 88, uh, I watched the Mackay, the Gary Mackay goal mm. in the Suffolk house, right? Do you remember there was a boozer called Suffolk? It's a big one now. It used to be very small. With the great Gary Cook, who does the fantastic Apre match mm. impersonation of Dumpy. Do you know Gary Cook? Yes, yeah, of and course. And yeah. I was in Trinity at the time, looking for somebody to watch this game, because knowing that, you know, if, if the Scots do something here for us, you know, we may well go through. And it was an extraordinary thing. Mm. And, and given that we'd been there before, you know, there, there, about a, a, a point away or two points away or a dodgy penalty decision away. But if you look at uh, Charlie Hockey, um probably under the influence of his mates, declared a tax amnesty about a year uh, around the time that Mackay scored the goal, right? Right. And something very interesting happened in Ireland. They declared a tax amnesty because everybody, well, not everybody, but lots and lots of people had money offshore in a scam called the offshore bank accounts where Irish people were avoiding a thing called dirt tax by pretending we were English, mm. right? And many, I think it was many, over 100,000 accounts abroad, and Charlie Hawley, understanding that the best way to get tax is to pretend to, it was never evaded, declared an amnesty. And I remember all this money flooding back into the economy. I was just in 1998, and I'm sure that some of the uh, credit union mortgages and credit union loans that financed the other seat of Stuttgart were on the back of the, uh, of the tax amnesty money coming back into the banking system. Mm. This is my thesis. I think we should go with that. We should go with it, we? <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm sold. Whatever you say, I'm sold. Did you <laughs> did you get out to Italy or no, Giant I, Stadium I, or anything? I got to I got to America. Uh, I got to America and I missed Giant Stadium. 
It was a, it was a long trip, which was very strange. But I got to uh, I got to Orlando, uh, two on very unpleasant experiences, mm. the Mexico and the Dutch. But I do remember the Dutch one. You know, the end. There was a place called Church Street. If people were there listening, they'll remember there was a the Americans have a very strange way of kind of barricading you to a street in order to drink, oh. right? Uh, it's just very unusual. So you're kind of all funneled in to Orlando and you're put in this place called Church Street and there was Dutch fans and ourselves and I'd, you know, it was kind of like a rite of passage to go talking football with Dutch people after games. Mm. And I, I just think they were great games. And, you know, I wish I'd gone to Stuttgart. I mean, you know, it was one of those things I was in college and I probably could have gone mm. and I just thought, ah, I don't have the cash. Yeah. Um, but uh, the very, the, the, what I, what I love is one of my great uh, loves is following the team around, was following the team around, to kind of obscure places. I used to like to go to odd games. Uh, but I remember the Anfield game was a particularly good game. Uh, I went with a friend of mine who's an artist who didn't like football at all, but I was joining no mates and I had no one to go to the game with me. So he, uh, he made a deal with me, which was that if I were to go to the Tate Modern with him in Anfield, in Liverpool, in the Docklands, he'd go to the football with me. <laughs> And I had my colours on, and I remember going in with my colours on into the Tate Modern, and the young fella on the white, you know, the the, the white TS scheme at the door, kind of looked at me, saw the colours, looked at me again, looked at the Tate Modern, because you're in the wrong place, mate. Yeah. He had no idea that football fans could go in to the Tate Modern ahead of the game, and we were an unusual couple, and we go to games together, me and the artists every now and then. He still demands that I go to obscure art galleries with him. But, I mean, that's the funniest thing about the football team. It was an all-encompassing thing. Mm. You know, you could, you could meet all sorts at games, and you could meet absolutely committed League of Ireland sorts, or you could meet those huge population. I remember Irish Brummies who used to follow the team around, you know? Uh, it definitely became a bit of a beacon for the, the expat community, not, not least because you have the son, grandsons of, of emigrants and sons of emigrants playing for the team as well. Look, look at the stats. Half a million Irish people emigrated to England alone in the 1950s. Half a million. Mm. So the team was their team. Mm. And I always got that sense that this was, that Charlton had a bigger sense of Irishness than that just narrow gauge 26 counties Republic of Ireland sense, that he understood that there was a bigger tribe out there. And of course, it wasn't what he was explicitly after. Of course, he was after better players yeah, sure. who could actually do a job. But the unintended consequence of that was to create uh, a big tribal gathering. I mean, I remember going to games and fans would be coming from all over the place. Like, it was really like it was like a magnet for the tribe. Mm. You know, whether it was Giant Stadium, whether it was any of the, any of the big games. Uh, there was always a sense to bump into people who would be second generation, third generation. It, I, it, was, it was just, it was a hoot. It was an absolute hoot. And as I said, the team were really good. They were really very good. Mm. You know, and uh, it's my son looks at me. He was, well, I was watching something last night. There was a good RT show last night. I was oh, the Ross, the Ross Whitaker one. Yeah, we've seen it yeah. a few times. God, I mean, it's brilliant. It's perfect. Perfect for the weekend that was in it. It's really, really good. But my son, who's 19, or he's 18, looks at me and he said, man, that's when Ireland used to win games. I said, yeah. that's second. His generation can conceive of a quarterfinal of a World Cup or even, even a decent, <laughs> decent qualifying. You can't con conceive of a World Cup full stuff, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you better tell him it's not happening anytime soon. I know, it's awful. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> but it's awful when the dad is even more excited than the young fella about yeah. football. That's... That's from the generations mixed badly in a family. You know? So and my missus my missus was watching the film last night and watching some Ole 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 carry on and she kinda of looked at me and she said, I'm so glad I didn't know you then. <laughs> <laughs> you've got you've got better with age. Better with age. I think I think I think there was a certain there was a certain uh, roughness around the edges that she would have found very difficult to deal with. I was on my best behaviour for ages. No doubt. But no doubt. seeing me in, in, in seeing me in my opal shirt would not have been a, a good look. <laughs> ah, the opal <laughs> shirt. Even that makes you nostalgic. Ah, um, you have to have the opal. You have course, to have the opal. Of course. Burn There's, it, oh, burn. Yes, indeed. Do you remember the abs? No, well, I, I no, I, I, I couldn't young. be lying. I'm a bit young. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the burn of the burn ads were top drawer, top drawer 1980s RTE ads. <laughs> I'll, I'll dig. Um, I'll dig them out on YouTube. <laughs> you should. You should. 
So, uh, look, a magical time, and yeah. uh, we're just touching on it with different people. So thanks so much for taking a call. Not at all, Joe. Pleasure. 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 Thanks a million. Take care. Dave McWilliams there. Cheers. One of many who was along for the ride, and uh, you heard it there. Celtic Tiger all down to Jack. That's the important point to remember. Don't let anyone uh, convince you otherwise. Still uh, playing at Old Trafford there into the 93rd minute now. It's still United 2, Southampton 1. So uh, into the last minute or so there, United about to take three points and go third in the table. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. It's not quite a TikTok lip sync of Donald Trump, but it's a close second. Gamble responsibly, cwe.net. At Specsavers, our stores are now open. So if your hearing or sight isn't quite right, please get in contact. We're doing everything to make sure your safety comes first, from limiting the people in store to disinfecting glasses and test equipment. We'll be wearing protective gear. So if you can't see our friendly faces behind our masks, <laughs> we promise they're still there. Specsavers, open with you in mind. Book an appointment online or call your nearest store. In Tuesday's Farming Independent, we take an in-depth look at debt levels on Irish farms. In Pedigree, the farmers leading the fight to save rare native breeds of sheep and cattle. And the young woman cooking up a storm from the family farm in West Cork. The Farming Independent, real stories worth paying for. In print or subscribe at independent.ie. A course that suits me. The supports I need to succeed. Qualifications that employers want. Learn the skills you need to find a job you love or go on to college with National Learning Network. NLN offers inclusive education and training in a safe, COVID-adapted environment to help people across Ireland reach their potential. Choose from hundreds of free courses, get work experience and a recognised qualification. NLN is enrolling now, so call 1890 or visit nln.ie and learn how to change your story. Here's to our local independent businesses. For the last few months, they have been adapting and surviving finding new ways to serve our communities. At Bank of Ireland, we're doing our bit. And because your financial well-being is our priority, our dedicated business teams can help you take the next step. So we can all keep tapping, clicking and collecting. And one day, getting back to what we all do best. We can, we will, begin. Bank of Ireland is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. When you've done your hammer during PE with Joe, relax, the football's back. Gamble responsibly, cdunlewy.net. Still United 2 went up in Southampton. I haven't seen the game too closely, obviously. I've been uh, busy, as you would have heard, uh, else engaged with uh, George Hamilton and Dave McWilliams, but they just put a graphic up there to say Martial has been given man of the match. He was ranking first and everything from dribbles to pass completion to touches in the box to sprints, 18 sprints had him first across the 90 minutes. So it seems like he had a good game. He scored one of United's two goals. Marcus Rashford scored the other. Lots of texts in on Jack Charlton, as you can imagine. Uh, Bernard says, my first memory of football, I was five in 88. My father bought an Opel car. The car salesman gave me the Irish mascot, Wolfhound Teddy Bear. I love that bear, watching the games with it. I can remember Jack's last game in Anfield like it was yesterday. On that day, our TV gave up. Myself and two brothers and father went to my uncle's house to watch the game. A sad night when Patrick Clivert scored those two goals, but the Irish fans wonderful, singing You'll Never Walk Alone. A great farewell to Jack. Thanks, Jack, for all the memories. May you rest in peace. It is a really nice text from Bernard. And David Bray. Folks, for all the young people who weren't there in 88 or 90, picture how empty the, empty the streets were at lockdown. It was like that during the games. And Dame Lane, after lockdown, ended. That was after the game, says David Bray. Yeah, there's an amazing photo. I think it's Coleman Doyle who took it half time in the English match at Italia 90. And there is one person, one person on O'Connell Street waiting for the bus. And otherwise, it's completely empty. As I speak, in the 96th minute, Southampton have just equalised. It's from a corner. It looks like it might be a Lindelof on goal, or else it's someone in Southampton got a nick to it. But regardless, from a corner, Southampton have equalised. So it's Man United 2. Southampton 2, that is very much two points dropped for Manchester United. Where does that leave them on the table? I think that puts them uh, level on points with Leicester is where that leaves them. So two points dropped at Old Trafford. They were seconds away from taking the three points. Uh, two all draw, it looks like, at Old Trafford. That is us done for this evening. Uh, OTBAM coming your way half past seven as usual. We're back then uh, seven o'clock with a really busy show. In the meantime, uh, if you want any of the content we brought you over the last while, the weekend, the OTB Sports app is the place to go. Tom Dunn is on the way next. Good luck.